Good morning. It's good morning. It's been a long day, I guess. Uh, good evening. Welcome to our evening service. It's so glad that uh, to have you, yeah, everybody come back, and hopefully you came back safely to our uh, worship service tonight. Let's stand together as we get started. Jesus Messiah. Let's sing together. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus Messiah, the name above all names. Blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah, the Lord of all, his body the bread, his blood the wine, broken and poured out all for love the whole earth trembled and the veil was torn love so amazing love so amazing jesus messiah name above all names blessed redeemer from heaven, Jesus Messiah, the Lord of all. All our hope is in you, all our hope is in you, all the glory to you, God, the light of Jesus Messiah, the name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah. Amen. Welcome back to our Sunday evening service. We have had a full day, that's for sure. Uh, early worship, Sunday school, late worship, lunch, deacons meeting, and now here we are back again. And I don't want to uh, concern you or worry you, but as I was coming uh, down uh, Skidaway, I saw animals lining up two by two. So there may be a sign there with all of this, uh, this rain continues to come. But we are glad that you're here. We're inside Bible Baptist Church. It's always sunny and 75. Amen. Amen. We can think positively that way. Well, if you were in the early service, you missed uh, the late hour. We had a wonderful uh, day as a young man, first-time visitor, came with the guest of a family and uh, walked the aisle, 22-year-old man, walked the aisle to trust Christ as a Savior today. And so we are rejoicing in that. Amen. And uh, thank the Lord for people inviting family and friends to come and hear uh, God's Word. And so you never know every Sunday who's going to be in the attendance and uh, just how the Lord works things out and the message and the moment and the Spirit of God is in all, uh, always with us and we are grateful for that uh, report uh, today. And if you're joining us online, thank you as well for, for being with us. Hopefully where you're at, uh, you are safe and warm and dry, okay, because <laughs> in Savannah, uh, we don't have the dry part going down. We don't. Uh, somebody told me this, and I'm not, I don't know if this is a southern thing, but somebody said, 
preacher, this is really a wet rain. I, I don't know what other rain you all have down here, but uh, it is a wet rain, that's for sure. That's for sure. We're looking forward to tonight's worship and uh, uh, fellowship with you. Thank you so much. The Iwana kids are over in their building and uh, working on their different ministries tonight, some special events going on with them. I'm going to ask Brother Skyler, our, our youth pastor, to come and lead us in prayer before the next few songs. And uh, good to see some more of our choir members coming back. Uh, some of the ensemble was there, and we were building that back in March, Lord willing, and uh, getting back to full choir soon and uh, with different safety precautions in place. Uh, but uh, looking forward to that. Uh, let's get started, Brother Schuyler, if you'd come and pray for us, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, God, just asking tonight, Lord, this you to bless this service. I pray that you use Pastor McInerney as he gives your word, preaches it clearly. Lord, I thank you for the message this morning of how a young man accepted you as a savior. Lord, I just pray that that message will ring in the hearts of those who are here this morning. And Lord, I just pray that soul, more souls can be saved through that message. Lord, I just thank you so much, Lord. I just ask that you bless us tonight. Thank you for the safety of all of us gathering here tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. You may be seated. Thank you so much as we continue. Have faith in God. Have faith in God when your pathway is lonely. He sees and knows all the way you have trod. Never alone are the least of his children. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. Have faith in God. He's on his throne. Have faith in God. He watches o'er his own. He cannot fail. With your grief and despair, cast all your cares and your burdens upon him and leave him there. Just leave him there. Have faith in God, he's on his throne. Have faith in God, he watches o'er his own. He cannot fail, he must prevail. God because he's true, he's right, and he's always on his throne, even in the midst of trouble. This song is Christ the Sure and Steady Anchor. I hope you can place your trust in him. Let's sing together. Christ the sure and steady anchor in the fury of the storm. When the winds of doubt blow through me and my sails have all been torn in the suffering in the sorrow when my seeking hopes are few i will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be removed christ the shore and steady anchor while the tempest rages on when temptation claims the battle and it seems the night has won deeper still then goes the anchor though i justly stand accused i will hold fast to the anchor it shall never be removed. Christ. 
Christ the shore and steady anchor through the floods of unbelief. Hopeless somehow, oh my soul, now lift your eyes to Calvary. This my ballast of assurance, see his love forever proved. All my hope is in the anchor, it shall never be Christ the shore and steady anchor as we face the wave of death. When these trials give way to glory as we draw our final breath, we will cross that great horizon, clouds behind and life secured, and the calm will be the better for the storms that we endure. Christ the shore of our salvation, ever faithful, ever true. We will hold fast to the anchor, it shall never be
Amen. Thank you. It's good to see the ensemble back. Brother Jody, are you ready for me? Okay. I didn't have a paper to tell me what to do, so here I am. And uh, appreciate that and uh, looking forward to having more and more as we expand that music ministry. And I enjoyed seeing Butch and Susan Boatwright. Rarely do we get a praise team husband and wife. It kind of reminded me of Roy Rogers and Dale Evans, kind of like that. <laughs> I'm going to ask a couple of my friends, Nelson Jackson and Bob Barnett, to come. And uh, these men have been visiting their wives. They're kind of like adopted grandparents to our kids. Both these men served as deacons of mine in uh, Ohio in various years past. And uh, we were just messing around at the piano, and Nelson had a song on his heart, and we figured it out and wrote it down. And uh, uh, so I'm going to ask them to come. We're going to just do a quick trio song. If we use these microphones, Jody, are oh, there two over here? Okay. All right, on the stand. So we'll try this song. The song talks about the potter. We're the clay. And uh, the song says, I'm so glad that he didn't throw the clay away. Amen? Amen. I came back to him, a vessel unworthy, so scarred with my sin, but he did not despair, he started over again, and I blessed the day he didn't throw the clay away. He fashions the clay, a vessel of honor I am today, all because Jesus didn't throw the clay picks up the pieces, he doesn't throw the clay away. Over and over, he molds me and makes me into his likeness. He fashions the clay, a vessel of fellas. Good job. All right. Thank you so much. It uh, brings back a lot of memories singing with those guys. I appreciate having them and their wives, uh, Diane and Vicki also, and then uh, Tiffany and Jace are here from Ohio. Tiffany is Brad Hausman's first cousin, and uh, I know her since she was 11 years old. And I visited uh, Beck at home out there in Clarksville, and uh, she answered the door and uh, visited with their family. And Jace, I've known you since you were in diapers. I think I actually held you maybe the day or two after you were born. And uh, we go way back with the 
uh, Beckett family and Fallis family, and uh, Jace is down here visiting his cousins for his birthday, and we're glad to have them. They got out of Ohio right in time. About 10 inches of snow heading towards Cincinnati right now, so uh, we're glad you guys are here. It's always good to see our uh, guests and friends back from back home. Well, 2 Corinthians 5, I've got to tell you just a little bit about this piano. I've told you that we're going to have a piano up here one day before Easter, amen? And I say what I mean and mean what I say, and uh, we're going to get it done, but here's the funny thing. Uh, keyboards are funny things if you know about music and uh no matter how, how nice the keyboard is, the electronics I'm talking about, it can't replace the piano. It's just not the same thing. And I struggled this morning. If you're in the first service, raise your hand. First service this morning. I, I got a little, uh, anyway, uh, slobbered through that song. It wasn't the keyboard's fault. But uh, I knew I messed that song up. I got a little emotional in that song. And I, uh, I'm not apologizing for that. It's just hard to sing when you can't see the words because you got tears in your eyes. And so I went back to check that out, and, and I watched myself play that keyboard over there, and the first thought came to my mind was Snoopy and Schroeder and that little piano. Because I'm not the little guy I used to be. So I look like I'm over there playing on a toy. And uh, we're going to remedy that situation. I talked with the deacons, and not just because it's electronic, but there's so much more when we have guest groups come in, quartets, Miss Melba, Janet, uh, uh, Rhonda, uh, anyone that plays a special. Uh, we want to have something more usable. For a church our size, a church of this, uh, of this uh, size and the way we do music, and we love our traditional music, amen, and uh, we're not going to change that, but we're going to go ahead and launch. We actually need two pianos. And we need a new piano to fit down here in the uh, orchestra pit because that one's about 50 years old. I'm 51, so I'm not knocking that. But that piano has been plumb worn out, and uh, it needs to be either totally re-gutted and redone, which is a very expensive venture. Uh, so Tommy told me one time a, a, a man high on something broke in the church and attacked that piano. I don't know if any of you guys remember that and uh, ripped the lid off that piano and flung it out here. He was high on something and flung it out here. Um, probably the most excitement the orchestra pit has ever seen. Um, but we're looking at replacing that piano and also getting another piano up here. And the Lord has blessed us, and we had some unexpected funds already this year that have come in, so we're going to put that towards it. But I got this idea 30 years ago we did this. There's 88 keys on a piano. And this piano up here is going to cost a little more than that, but we're going to start with that. And uh, we're, going to, we're going to buy a key, all right? $100 a key. And so we need 88 people over the next couple weeks. We're going to go ahead and buy it, but we're going to just replace the money when it comes. So if you want to buy a key on the brand new piano or that was new to us, it'll be a used one uh, because the, the, it's kind of like buying a car when you buy them new, you know. But we're going to buy a used one, a good quality one. We've got one for down here and one for over here. And so we're going to do that. And if you want to buy a key, I'll write it out in the pastor's page. $100 a key, $8,800. That will almost pay for that piano. And then we'll use the money that came in unexpectedly. or well, I say unexpectedly. It wasn't budgeted for anything. We're going to use that money for the other piano. And we'll be all done. Amen? And here in a few weeks, we will be in high cotton. We'll be piano playing fools around here. And so uh, if you've been hiding your talent about playing the piano until we get a new piano, I'm coming for you. Amen? And we're going to get that started. So uh, uh, help us out. If you'd like to give $100 towards the piano or as many as you want, buy as many keys as you want. And uh, we sell more than 88 keys, we'll put it towards the other one. But uh, you pray about it and help us over the next few weeks market uh, uh, piano, Preacher Piano Project or P times 3. Okay, you could do that. In your Bibles tonight, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we invite you to stand as we read God's Word together. Hey, what happened to you is the title of the message tonight. Hey, what happened to you? 2 Corinthians 5, beginning in verse 17. You may know this verse by heart. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a what, church? New creature, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God 
was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. A uh, very simple message tonight, uh, simple songs this morning that I sang, simple message this morning, a simple message tonight. What happened uh, to you? And I want to look at uh, several things that happen when a person uh, trusts Christ as their Savior. When salvation comes to a person, especially to an adult, especially to an adult, there ought to be a noticeable difference in that person. Amen? How many of you were saved as an adult? Okay, about a third of you. That's a pretty high number. And um, I was saved as a child. I'm assuming the rest of you that didn't raise your hand were saved as a child, or you have not yet made a decision for Christ, one of those two. But when a child gets saved, there's not a long record of, uh, of life to contrast their new life in Christ. You follow what I'm saying? Uh, because, yes, there are a lot of children who are sinners. We're all children are sinners. Because we're born into it, as I said this morning. And some have taken it to a whole new level of heathenosity. But there's not a long laundry list. I remember Jim Delishmet, the evangelist, who was saved out of the Hell's Angels in St. Louis, Missouri. And all the stories he could tell, but he wouldn't tell, because he said, I'm not going to give the devil credit for all those years that he had me under his thumb. And I'm talking, he had 60 men under his leadership, the Hells Angels of St. Louis, Missouri. And that was, it was not just old fat men riding on Harleys. This was the real deal. You know what I'm trying to say? This was not just the weekend warriors. This was the real deal. 1970s, St. Louis, Missouri, Hells Angels. And he said, I'm not going to give the devil credit. I'm not going to tell all the stories. But as adults, even if you don't have something as sordid as that, you do have a history of knowing what life was like before Christ versus what life has been like after Christ. And when salvation comes to a person, especially an adult, there ought to be a noticeable difference in that person. We don't all have the same testimony and we don't all deal with the same things, but when a person becomes a child of God, something happens. Amen. Something happens. There's a change. According to this verse, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Something happens to a city when revival comes. Something happens to a church when revival comes. I heard the illustration the missionary gave who was in England back in history. I'm trying to look at the date. I can't find the date, but it was a small village. And this man came through the village in England, northern England, and he was a traveler, and he was looking for a pub. And he asked one of the townspeople, he couldn't find a pub. And he asked one of the townspeople, why has this village no pub? Listen. He said, well, a hundred years ago, John Wesley preached a revival here. <laughs> Did you get that? There was no beer joint in that village because a hundred years prior... Revival had broken out. There was a change in that entire community. And there's certainly a change in the life of an individual when they get saved. What happened to you? If somebody asks you what happened to you, then here's my response. Let me give you four things, four responses to that question. What happened to you when you got saved? Number one, we touched on it a lot this morning. The blood cleansed me. The blood cleansed me. Notice 1 John 1, 7. 1 John 1, 7, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. What happened to you? Well, the very first thing that happened to me is the blood has washed my sins away. I've been justified. I've been sanctified. Just like Naaman's story. Remember Naaman and Elisha and the leprosy that that man was under. That's a picture of sin there in that Old Testament story. 
And when he followed the word of God, and he listened to the man of God, the leprosy was taken away. And a very wonderful phrase in that story about Naaman, it says that his flesh came again like a child. His flesh came again like a child. Do you know what happened to you? When you got saved, the blood cleansed you from all unrighteousness, from all sin. And in the eyes of God, no wonder the, the phrase, you must be born again like a child. Like a child, we became new in the eyes of God. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. The blood cleansed me. I stand redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. Listen, and sinners plunged beneath that flood. What church? Lose all their guilty stains. All their guilty stains. The blood has cleansed me. Isaiah, I quoted in one of the services this morning. They all run together since 7 a.m. But it says, though they be red like crimson, they shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow. The blood cleansed me. What happened to you? What happened to you? Well, I was set free as we talked about this morning. That curse that held me has been broken. The chains that bound me have been released. And the blood has cleansed every stain. Think about that. Your past, your present, and your future. The blood has cleansed every stain. What happened to you? Well, thanks for asking. Number two, the birth changed me. The verse that we read, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. A great change has taken place in the life of every believer. A great change has taken place in the moment, in that, the quickness of that transaction. As I said before, salvation is spontaneous. It's instantaneous. Sanctification uh, takes some time, and we're continually working. You know the song, He's Still Working on Me? You know that song, He's Still Working on Me? That song was written for Philip Brand. Amen? He, he, he is the poster child of that song. God is still working on you, and He's still working on me. Day by day, He's molding that clay as these men just sang about. He doesn't throw it away. If you read Jeremiah 17, it says that He, he, he made it again. It was His in his hand, in his power. And when there was a mar in the clay, he, he recast it. He made it again to his pleasure. We are a new creature in Christ. We've been changed. Not a remodeled creature, not a refurnished creature, a refurbished creature, I guess, but a new creature. Now, I did this a while back. I don't know When's the last time? But you got to play. Everybody's got to play, or this could be a long message, okay? But an evangelist taught us this song. He came to our church and did a revival, and every night he, he made us sing this song. So you, all you got to do is repeat after me, okay? Now you got to do it just like I do it. AJ, you ready? You want to come up and help me? No, okay, okay. <laughs> just testing you. Okay, here we go. Listen to the word new every time we say it in this song. You ready? I sing a new song. Oh, that was pitiful. Let's try it one more time. What part of everybody don't you understand? Okay, here we go. Ready? I sing a new song. Since Jesus came, serve a new master, wear a new name, walk a new road, have a new goal, know a new peace. Down deep in my soul. Hey, that wasn't too bad. It wasn't too good, but it wasn't too bad. <laughs> Did you hear that? A new song, a new name, a new master, a, a new road, a new goal, a new peace. What happened to you? Hey, he made a change. The new birth changed me. Heaven came down. And glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down 
and glory filled my soul. Hey, we've got a lot to talk about, amen? As children of God, as saved, as redeemed, as blood-washed, born-again children of the King, we've got a lot to talk about. The birth changed me. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And uh, I'm going to try to uh, follow up with the, the young man that walked the aisle today and just, uh, uh, just an exciting thing, amen, uh, for a young person to be saved because they got their whole life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I, I've led people to Christ. The oldest was 100 years old. And recently I had a, a man, 85, he's been sitting here in the front row every Sunday since he got saved. But pastor can share this. You get people past 60, 70, 80, 90 years old, the number of them getting saved is very small. And you think about that, and you think about a young person getting saved. You think about these children over here coming to know the Lord at a tender age. And their whole life ahead of them to serve the Lord and to walk with the Lord. And what a blessing to know that he made that change. And I'm for anybody getting saved at any age, but I remember a man... I'm not sure if it was Pastor Lamb or Pastor Smith that led him to Christ, and he was in his 70s before he got saved, and he was dying. And the wife called the pastor. I can't remember if it was Pastor Lamb or Pastor Smith now, and uh, went and comforted the man. And uh, he said, sir, are, 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 you, are you scared of dying? You're saved now. You belong to God. Listen. He said, I'm not scared to die, preacher. I'm ashamed to die because I wasted all those years of not serving the Lord. I'm not scared to die. I'm ashamed to die. You see, the change came, and if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, but think about the potential. That's why this children's building is so important. That's why these Awana programs are so important. That's why the teen ministry is so important in our college men and women. Not that the others are not important, but think about the opportunity for them to serve the Lord all the days of their life. Dr. John Rawlings was well known. I don't think he wrote this, but he put it on a hundred buses that went around Cincinnati. He said, it is far better to build boys and girls than to repair men and women. It is far better to build boys and girls than to repair men and women. Hey, God's in the change business, amen? He's in the changing business. And the song says, if he can make a change in me, he can make a change in you. What happened to you? The blood cleansed me. The birth changed me. Number three, the book convinced me. Now, hang on for a second. The book. You know what they used to call this? The old timers would call this the good book. Not a good book. The good book. And this book right here, convinced me. I wasn't convinced by a church. I wasn't convinced by a denomination. I wasn't convinced by a man. I was convinced and convicted by the Word of God. Think with me, we're studying the kings on Wednesday nights, and this week, I think this week's Uzziah, we're going to go to Josiah, and I don't mean to give all my lesson away early, but go with me to 2 Chronicles 34, and I'll give you a little background on Josiah. The instruction has been given to repair the temple. It had been left in disarray and clutter. Things had not been taken care of. The priests had not been paid. They had said, you know what? We're done with this. Nobody's coming to worship. Nobody's giving. The building's in disrepair. Uh, nobody cares about the, the feast, the ordinances, the law. Uh, they went. They left. And the house of God had been abandoned. You can read the story for yourself. But notice what happens here in verse 18 of 2 Chronicles 34. Then Shaphan, the scribe, told the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath given me a book, 
Well, that book happened to be (laughs) the Old Testament, the Word of God, the Law, the Torah, the books of Moses that we've been talking about. And Shaphan read it before the king. And it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the law, that he rent his clothes, and the king commanded Hilkiah and Ahikam the son of Shaphan and Abdon the son of Micah, and Shaphan the scribe, and Isaiah a servant of the king, saying, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. And it's a sad chapter in Israel's history. You can go back and read the preceding chapters and you'll find that they were in disarray They were in disobedience, they were in disorganization, and now they found the book in cleaning the house of God, in repairing the temple, they found this dust-covered, moth-eaten, wrinkled pages, scrolls if they were, and, and they looked at it, they said, this looks important, somebody better tell the king about this book. And what's so sad is that the king, to that point, didn't even know the book existed and was shocked to the point of grief when he realized how far off the rails Israel had gone from the book. And he sends the priest to inquire of the Lord about his judgment. Listen. I wasn't convinced by a church or by a denomination or by a man. I was convinced and convicted by the Word of God. I can just see it. I get, I get visuals in my mind when I'm reading the Bible, and I could just see that, that room assembled. And if you read the story, it was kind of like it wasn't the first point of, of the meeting. It was kind of like we did this, we did this, we did this, and by the way, we found the book. And Josiah says, read it to me. And they began to read it, and I can almost picture, it says he rent his clothes, which was a sign of distress and a sign of mourning and grief and heartbreak and sorrow. And as they're reading the book to him, to the ears of the king, the conviction of the Spirit of God was coming upon Josiah. The book convinced me, friend. It convicted me. It convinced me of his love, John 3, 16. You know that we used it today, that God so loved the world. It convinced me of his love. It convinced me of my need for a Savior, just even as a seven-year-old boy. It was the Word of God that, that penetrated my heart. Romans 10, 13, for whosoever, go ahead, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Convinced me of my need for a Savior. Convinced me of the truth, John 17, 17. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5, every word of God. If you don't have that one underlined or uh, uh, highlighted in your Bible, that's a good one to do. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. And then Hebrews 4, 12, I alluded earlier, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And when you see someone, when you see someone uh, in the service, you see someone in a revival, you see some child in in Bible school, and you're teaching and preaching the Word of God, and, and you cannot explain it, my friend. There's something that the Holy Spirit does when these words are read and preached and takes those words and works his way to the heart of that individual who's hearing that maybe for the very first time or who has been enlightened to the point now of understanding. And it is that word of God that penetrates the heart and will cause a young man in the first time in a crowd of 300 people to walk in aisle with tears in his eyes. That's not the word of a man. That's not because it says Baptist out there. That's the power of the word of God. The book convinced me of the Savior. And here's 
another message I could preach, but I won't. Why is there no, I'll say no, why is there so little conviction in the hearts of people today? Because there is so little preaching of the Word of God. They couldn't buy conviction in most churches today. They don't know what it looks like. They don't experience it. Because the Bible is largely left unread and unspoken by the person on the platform who's charged with preaching the Word. That's why there's so little convincing and conviction. Forget who it was. It's a story of history. And back in the days of the Great Awakening, it may have been Ben Franklin. I'm not sure, but it, it, it rings in my mind. But I tell you, it's been a long day. Yeah. And in the story that a businessman in the little New England town, I think it was Ben Franklin, I think it was, saw Ben Franklin hur hurrying down the street. He said, Franklin, where are you going? He said, I'm going to hear Whitfield preach. He said, but you don't believe what Whitfield preaches. He said, I know, but he does. Shazam! Maybe only preachers get that story, I don't know. You don't believe what he preaches. I know, but he does, and I want to hear it. A man who's not convicted by his own message is not going to bring conviction to the hearts of his listeners. Amen? We don't give soliloquies in the Baptist church. We don't give monologues. We don't give commentary. We don't lecture. We don't share. That sounds nice, doesn't it? We're to preach the Word of God. And it was through the preaching of the Word of God. Somebody preached the Word of God to you. Now, it may not have been a pastor in a pulpit. It may have been a grandmother. It may have been a friend. It may have been a coworker, a neighbor, a, a, a fellow student. But somebody used the Word of God. As a matter of fact, I dare say without the Word of God, you can't be saved. Because the Word of God is the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And the Word of God is what penetrates and convicts the hearts of sinful men. The Word of God. The book convinced me. The blood cleansed me. The birth changed me. You know what number four starts with? Believing committed me. Now, I preached a couple weeks ago about that $10 no commitment message. Remember that? You don't remember that. It was a doozy, I'm telling you. It was a good. Believing committed me. What do you mean by that? What in the world do you mean by that? Well, because the blood cleansed me and because the birth changed me and because the book convinced me, believing those things committed me to the cause of Christ. Don't fall short here. Many say, I've been cleansed. I've been washed in the blood, man. Many say, I've been changed. My life is so different. So different. And I want to explain something too. The book doesn't just convince you of salvation. The book convinces you of your walk with Christ. You with me? So many times people get enough of the book to be saved, but they don't stay in the book in order to walk with the Lord. That's why church is so important. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. Faith comes by hearing, and you may not understand it, but what we're doing here tonight on a Sunday night in soggy Savannah, but in here it's sunny in 75. What we're doing here tonight is vitally important to your spiritual nourishment.
to your spiritual growth. You watching along with us. Maybe you're snowbound. Maybe you're out of state. Maybe you can't be here for other reasons of health. But think with me. What you're doing tonight by listening to the Word of God, it's, it's more than just for salvation. It's for the daily walk with Jesus. The book, Believing, commits me. Many say I'm changed. I'm convinced, but I'm not going to be committed. No, listen, if you're truly convinced, you can't help but be committed. Because if you're not committed to the cause of Christ, then you really aren't convinced, right? Are you all with me? I'm, I'm trying to go back between Perry Mason and Matlock and tie this thing together. Just Perry Lock, we'll call it, Okay. How can you be truly convinced and then not be committed? Because if you're not committed, that means there's some doubt. That there's some gray area. There's some shade that you're not 100% convinced. Because if you're 100% convinced, you can't help but be committed to take your place on the front line in the service of the Lord. You can tell what people believe in by their commitment to it. Example would be if you're attending church regularly. Maybe not some, you don't come every Sunday night or Wednesday night, but you, you come regularly, you come faithfully, you attend church. You believe that's, that's an outward symbol that you believe it's an important thing for you and your family. Whereas if you can skip month after month after month after month, you obviously don't believe it's important, Right? My mentor, Pastor Smith, always told us this. People are going to do what they want to do. So if whatever you think is important, that's what you're going to do. And you're not going to do something if you don't think it's important. It's very simple. It's not even a spiritual lesson. It's just a human nature lesson. People are going to do what they want to do. And as committed Christians, you can tell what people believe in by their commitment to it. If someone's married for a long time and you see that that's a commitment to their spouse, that's they believe that's important. They believe that's important. But if they don't make that commitment, they just bounce from relationship to relationship or shacking up to shacking up, you obviously know to them marriage is not important. But you can tell by the commitment people make to the cause. You can tell. Believing those things of Christ, believing what the book says, believing that I've been changed and called to be a new creature, believing that the blood has washed every sinful stain, then I must be committed to the cause of Christ. What happened to you? Well, believing in Christ commits me to serving God. If I'm committed to Christ, I have no right to be serving any other gods. Amen? I I have no right to be chasing after idols. Because I'm committed to the Savior. We love Him because He first loved us. That's a, he made the commitment to us, and we, when we're saved, make the commitment to Him. What happened? Believing in Christ commits me to serving God, to love the Lord my God with all my heart and soul and mind. Believing in Christ commits me to sharing His Word. Sharing His Word. I, I said it last week. I've never met, in 30 years of ministry, I've never met a Christian who doesn't want other people to be saved. And I know that's a a non... You say, preacher, that doesn't even... You don't even have to explain that. I I understand that. I just want to show you my point. There's not a a saved person that desires for other people to just die and go to hell. But if we're committed to the cause of Christ, we will be 
doing all that we can to share the gospel with other people. It's not enough just to pray that they don't go to hell. We need to pray that they get saved. We need to involve ourselves in sharing the gospel and being that light of the world and, and being the only Jesus that some will ever see. And in, in, in sharing gospel tracts, inviting people to church. My wife and I were looking for cars. It, it was a, a long ordeal, about a week long. But if every salesman that told me they would come to church keeps their commitment, we're going to have a salesman Sunday one day. Because we invited a pile of them. And uh, I hope they come. Uh, a couple of them I told Mike Mosley would buy them lunch, so I think they will come. Mike, be ready. <laughs> we need to be involved in sharing that and telling folks about Jesus and seeing others saved. Believing in Christ committed me to that. you, you got to understand something. Your first commitment is to Christ. You may be committed to the church, but that's secondary to your commitment to Christ. Amen? He is first. You may be committed to a ministry that the Lord put that on your heart, and that is, that's, your, that's your baby, that, as far as that's your focus, and that's, you believe that's what God wants you to do. That's wonderful. But your first commitment is to Christ, your Savior. You follow what I'm trying to say? I'll give you an example. I've been at this a long time. So people committed to a ministry in the church, but it's not their week to serve in the ministry, so they don't come to church. Hello? Hello? Do you see what I'm trying to say? Are you committed to Christ and His church, or are you just committed to your job? There's a big difference. If it's not your turn to sing, you should still be here. Amen? If it's not your turn to preach, you should still be here. Commitment to Christ is first and believing these things, that I've been changed, that I've been washed. Believing those things commits me. If you really, truly believe that any man in Christ is a new creature and old things are passed away and all things are become new, whether you're teaching a Sunday school, working in the nursery, doing a wand or whatever, singing in the choir, playing an instrument, we're committed to Christ. If you're really saved, something happened to you. Amen? I was there when it happened. Nobody's going to take that away from me. Amen? <laughs> I was there when it happened. I know when Jesus saved me. The blood cleansed us. The birth changed us. The book convinced us. And believing those things committed us. What happened to you? Now, you know what? When somebody asks you that, they may not expect the answer you're about to give them. <laughs> but when we're saved, there's a change. When we're saved, there's a difference. And the Apostle Peter said, be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you of the hope that is within you. To give an answer. So when somebody says, hey, you're different. Young people, some of you are newly saved. And your friends or your family that's not saved, they may say to you, what happened to you? What happened to you? I'm a new creature in Christ. I'm changed. I'm different. I don't have those old ways anymore. I don't, I don't talk the same. I don't act the same. What happened to you? Well, I can't explain it in so many words, but I'm a new creature in Christ. I have new love, new loyalty. 
The Holy Spirit has convicted me and brought me to a place of a new walk and new life in Christ. Usually, when somebody says to you, what happened, it has a negative connotation, doesn't it? What happened to you? Like you were in an accident with a ladder. Say, you lost your job. What happened to you? You went to the hospital. What happened to you? There, there's usually some kind of a negative thing. My point of tonight's message is what happened to me is not negative at all. It's the most positive thing that could ever happen. That I could be a new creature in Christ. I hope that change has happened for you. And If you're watching tonight or you're here tonight and you have never had the experience that the Bible talks about, being born again, being a new creature in Christ. I pray that tonight you would call upon Him as your Savior. Would you bow your heads in prayer with me, please? And especially to those who are watching us online. If you do not know Christ as your Savior, tonight is a perfect opportunity, a perfect time And maybe through the preaching and reading of this Bible, the book has convinced you and convicted you of your lost estate and your need to know Christ as your Savior. And if that's the case here or online, please pay close attention these next 30 seconds. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And most, if not all of you in this auditorium have already done that. You've been changed. You've been cleansed. But if you have not yet received Christ, would you be willing to pray this simple prayer of faith? Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner and I believe that I need to be saved. I recognize my sin and I believe that you died on the cross to pay for my sin and to save me I believe that you rose from the dead and tonight I call upon you to be my savior and I ask you to forgive me of my sin and to save my soul And I ask, Lord, that you would help me to live for you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Friend, would you stand with us as Brother Jody leads us in song? Just a few verses of prayer. Uh, Invitation will not tarry or waste your time, but if God's spoken to your heart, what happened to you? Let's rejoice in the change. Let's rejoice in the blood that cleansed us. Let's rejoice in the book that brings us conviction. As we sing, you come. But that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. The second verse. Just as I am and waiting not to my soul of one dark blot to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. One last verse. Just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask.